so as you can see, I've brought an entire book of stuff to say about ROM. <laughs> uh oh. But I figured that, you know, everybody knows that ROM's uh, been our uh, premier snake man for the last 40 years. Uh, everybody knows that ROM started the first sea turtle project in India 40 years ago, 1973. Uh, everybody knows that ROM's been working on crocs for the last 40 years. So I thought I should say some things about, about ROM that, that you don't know. Um, all the animals that he's eaten, um, all the girls he's had crushes on, <laughs> and that have had crushes on him. But uh, I've been told subsequently that that information is uh, um, confidential. So I'm going to tell you three things about ROM. The first is that ROM is an extraordinary HR guy, uh, a headhunter one might call. Uh, over the last few, uh, few months, uh, last couple of years, I've been talking to a bunch of people that became herpetologists in India, uh, herpetologists, photographers, filmmakers, conservationists uh, in the 70s and the 80s. And I asked them, so how did you get interested in this? And the story usually goes like, oh, I was in Madras, I, I, was, I was doing a course that I didn't enjoy, and I used to you know, wander around, and I used to go and hang about in you know, this place that they started called Snake Park, and Ram came up to me and said, hey man, do you want to clean out a snake pit? And an extraordinary number of people became, found their careers uh, starting with cleaning out a snake pit at, uh, at Krog Bank. Um, Rom is an extraordinary real estate agent. Um, he, um, when I was a child, I always wanted a house in the hills and a house by the sea. Uh, Rom has a beautiful, set up a beautiful field station uh, in the Andaman Nicobar Islands. He's uh, set up another beautiful one uh, in the Western Ghats. Uh, and he has a lovely house in Chengalpet. Um, and he set up all of these phenomenal facilities which are doing amazing research today, but he set them up in these beautiful locations, and I think of him as one of the best real estate agents I know. Uh, but that leads me to the last part, which is that these, that these beautiful places where he set up these uh, field stations, he set up these extraordinary institutions. But much before that, he set up the Madras Snake Park Trust and then the Madras Crocodile Bank. And uh, that sort of makes him you know, a phenomenal wildlife ecology conservation entrepreneur as well. So the headhunter, the real estate agent, the entrepreneur, uh, that's Ram Whitaker for you. Uh, I will finish with a, with a, with a small story. Uh, when, we were in the, when we were in Little Andamans um, uh, earlier this year, uh, we came back from a fishing trip and our boat is run by this really old uh, Karen boatman, Uncle Bernie. And uh, Uncle Bernie must be in his late 70s, and he, he's, still, uh, he's still very fit and does all of the work related to the boat and a bunch of other stuff as well. And so as we approached the shore, they, they, docked the, uh, they, they, they anchored the boat, and Rom jumped off and started swimming. And Uncle Ber Bernie watched him very curiously for a while. And uh, then when he came ashore, he came. He was all dripping and wet. He came up and stood next to me, and he said, Socha wo buddha ter nahi sakega. So I repeated that to Ram, and Ram, of course, goes up to Uncle Bernie and says, who are you calling a Buddha? You know? <laughs> so uh, without further ado, I give you Ramalus Whitaker. I just first um, would like to do the, uh, I'd just like to say thanks very much for everybody coming here tonight. Thanks very much for our fantastic association of the Croc Bank with SCCS. Thanks to Ravi for organizing a lot of this stuff and all of our colleagues here today. And having said thank you, uh, just to get into a bit of the background, I was always totally hung up on snakes, ever since I can remember. And I was pretty small when I first started out. And this was up in northern New York State. I had a mother who was very supportive. She knew there weren't any venomous snakes around there, so she let me indulge myself. And uh, one day, when I was probably about five years old, I came back home with a snake which had been slaughtered by some of my little brat friends. And it affected my mother and my sister very strongly. And I think that could have been the kickoff to my career. I, 
I, mean, I don't really remember that instance, but my mother and sister told me about it, and it must have made some impression on me deep inside. Uh, well, I'll be skipping around a lot during this talk uh, chronologically, just so I can get every bit of the uh, story in, so just bear with me. I came to India at age seven, and I grew up in Bombay and Kodi Canal. I was already deeply into snakes, and uh, I had uh, a pet python which lived under my bed in school and a few other things which the, the staff didn't know about, and I guess I can't tell you about some of the stuff. But uh, there was no peer group then, and I, I sort of learned everything by myself, and to be honest with you, I'm probably pretty lucky to have survived that period, because I did have early encounters with pit vipers and then Russell's viper when I was 13, and made it through all that. Um, I, I did finish school, barely, and then I went on uh, in the tradition of the Cody school graduates to go to America for higher studies. And I did go to America, and I lasted an entire year in college. It was an incredible experience. I did a lot of hunting and fishing. I was in Wyoming, and I did a bit of studying, but the Fs outweighed the A's and B's, so I gave up. Um, I, w I was actually, for about a year or so after that, I wandered around, did various jobs. I even got a job on a ship, and I, as a merchant seaman, I went around the world twice. It was a yeah, good confidence-building sort of experience and all that. But I was really wanting to head home. So I started off toward home, and ended up in Miami, Florida. And there I was very much wanting to meet a guy called Bill Hast, the ultimate snake guru. And interestingly and surprisingly, there was a job opening there, and he gave me a job. So the next two years, I worked for Bill Hast, and it was my first really professional association with snakes. There I was, I was learning snake, venomous snake handling, venom extraction, I was learning how to educate people about snakes, and I had a peer group of other snake hunters, and we spent a lot of our free time uh, wandering around the Everglades, in that wonderful part of South Florida. So it was a very exciting time for me. But uh, then I was ready to head home, and after two years of helping Uncle Sam lose the Vietnam War, I ended up coming back. Um, I, I came back to Bombay, and I started a venom lab outside of Bombay in a place called Gaimuk Bandar, way out uh, on the end of South Set Island. It was an exciting time, and I had this dream I was going to set up the Bombay Serpentarium. And by that time, I started uh, uh, rummaging around in the Bombay Natural History Society. There were actually very few wildlifers in those days compared to now, but there were some really great ones. Uh, like Salim Ali, Humayun uh, uh, Abdul Ali, Zafar Fatih Ali, Dharma Kumar Sinji, Ranjit Singh, S.P. Sahi, uh, Pat Stracy, and Kenneth Anderson, and all these people I had the luck of uh, associating with at some stage or the other in those developmental period. Um, I traveled around India a lot, and I ended up back down in good old Madras, and uh, ran into the Irlas. Uh, I, I uh, suddenly found a peer group. Here was a whole tribe of snake-catching people. And these are people with magnificent skills, marvelous skills, which I admired greatly. But at the same time, I sympathized very much with them and their plight, because I don't have to describe the plight of tribals in India. It's, it's endless and mindless, but it, it was the same for them, too. And, and it's the same today, unfortunately. But I was very impressed by them, and uh, as I went along working with them, I was able to perhaps help out in, in some, way, some ways. But I had found my peer group. Um, I'm, I'm sorry I'm keeping notes because I got a crap memory. I, I, uh, I got something called scrub typhus. I'm blaming scrub typhus, actually. It's just, uh, <laughs> anyway. Uh, so, in 1969, I, I, I moved down to Madras because my peer group was there. They were the Urlas. 
and I set up the first snake park. It was uh, at a little village outside of town, and we decided to open it to the public. It was just like I had it sort of modeled like the Miami Serpentarium, so I started charging tickets, 25 paisa per ticket, and uh, amazingly, a lot of people came out from Madras to see the snakes, and, and, and I got press coverage, and so it, it actually became quite a popular attraction. I, I was quite amazed myself. And uh, then I walked into the uh, office of the chief conservative forest and said, how about giving me some land in Gindi Deer Park? Gindi Deer Park, for those of you who don't know it, is an amazing piece of forest, protected forest, in the middle of the city of Madras, Chennai, as you like to call it now. Some people do. Um, and they said yes. And the, the, the chief conservative forest, I remember his name, K.A. Boja Shetty, quite a character. He said, yes, we can give it to you for a 25-year lease uh, on the basis of 200 rupees per year. I, my, I, my eyes must have gotten really big, and I must have, maybe I fainted, I'm not sure. But whatever it was, here I, I was made. I mean, we, then of course we had to start raising money to do this. And uh, luckily, the World Wildlife Fund had just started a couple of years earlier in Bombay, and they actually gave me my first grant. I think it was 5,000 rupees, which doesn't sound like much now, but it was just what we needed then to get things started. I uh, had, uh, there were a few local companies and friends who chipped in money, and most of all, my sister Nina and my brother Neil and some of our friends chipped in all of their time for no salary at all, just a bit of food to eat now and then, uh, to, make me, to help make, me make the first snake enclosures. So it actually started happening. And in fact, in a very short time, within a year, we had a million visitors a year there. I mean, we are in the center of Madras, and people are always looking for something to do. And this was very exciting and very interesting, although kind of weird. Uh, but we had a lot of visitors. Um, meanwhile, I was... Uh, getting a bit serious, too. I started writing a lot of notes about the snakes that I was observing, and, and the Bombay Natural History Society, against their better judgment, published these as notes in the journal of the BNHS. You can even see some of this embarrassing stuff if you go into the archival stuff. And uh, some of it's okay, but <laughs> some of it's pretty amusing. Uh, we, uh, uh, <coughs> of course, I was uh, still the... Uh, same sort of strange character I am today. No, I mean, I was even stranger then. But, uh, which was also an attraction in a way, because people wanted to come and see what this guy is doing exactly. But we started venom extraction, uh, and we started uh, doing some field research projects. And um, conservation was, uh, we, we got a friend of mine in, in South Carolina to send us an alligator, so we had, you know, we started branching out with different species of reptiles, just to make it more interesting for people. And conservation was just getting going, uh, but uh, the snakeskin trade was booming at that time. Um, in the early 70s, it was in the vicinity of 10 million snakeskins a year being exported from India. It was quite phenomenal. And um, uh, frog legs were going out, uh, tons of frog legs were being exported from India. Uh, there was no Wildlife Act. There was uh, um, uh, sea turtle um, slaughter market down in Tutakarin was going great guns. Uh, every, almost, literally every day, uh, sea turtles were being caught around Crusader Island in that Gulf of Manar area and brought to Tutakarin for slaughter. There was uh, an, a, a few years later, um, we documented. Um, a tremendous market in Ridley sea turtles up in West Bengal. And uh, so it was really happening. And, and uh, by taking these photographs and publishing them in, in national magazines, we really started making some noise. And at that time, we also really lucked out uh, by the fact that Mrs. G was the PM. I mean, she even took the time to come to the snake park and uh, touch a python. and. Rajiv and Sonia Gandhi also showed up at that time. So this was all very good for, you know, 
for good PR for us and good PR for wildlife and particularly for reptiles. We were suddenly conservationists. It was quite an amazing sort of uh, realization that, yes, we're not just uh, snake guys or snake catchers. We, we're doing something very serious here. And meanwhile, I was um, making very regular trips to, uh, well, uh, this is again an, another bit of the turtle market that was very strong up there. But also at that time, pardon the dates and stuff, I'm skipping around like mad, but um, around this time in the early 70s, I was making regular visits to the Western Ghats to collect reptiles. And one day I ended up in Silent Valley. And there was some heavy machinery parked down in there, and um, there was the sound of seismic uh, blasting going on. And it really, it did something to me. It really tore into my soul. And I wrote about it in the World Wildlife Fund newsletter at that time. And with the involvement of a whole host of very important people, the Silent Valley signaled the real, uh, the real start, the real beginning of, uh, of India's conservation movement. And I'm, I'm really proud to have been part of it at that time. I, even though it was a small part, I, I felt I was an important part of it. Um, and, and the crocs started breeding at the croc bank. Uh, we had this, it was a tiny half acre of land and the croc enclosure wasn't very big. I didn't think they'd do very well there, but man, they started breeding. Uh, the first croc we got, in fact, was from the Madras Aquarium. He was seven feet long and he was living in a seven foot long aquarium. And uh, the uh, fisheries department said, no, no, we'll give him to you and put him in a nice large enclosure. And so they started breeding and we realized that we should do something about this. So in 1975, I bought land on the East Coast Road with Zai Whitaker, and again with World Wildlife Fund and, and other uh, inputs, funding inputs, we made the first enclosures. And uh, this is what it looked like, the first mugger enclosure that we had. It still looks kind of the same, except there are a lot of trees there now. It's like quite a jungle now. Um, then by this time, I was getting recognition as a crook man. And uh, it kind of surprised me that suddenly I was getting asked to come to, on various UN, UN projects around different parts of the world, really fascinating places like New Guinea and Indonesia, Malaysia, and Africa. And while I was gone, some of the uh, Snake Park trustee uh, were performing some hanky-panky. We won't go into the details about all that boring stuff, but it kind of teed me off. And uh, I had a serious tiff with some of them. And so they filed two criminal cases and two civil suits against me. And that, I tell you, was a big drag because it was very energy draining. And I said, no, I'm leaving India now. I really got angry. But uh, by that time, we had got this land at the Croc Bank, and it was going. So I sort of made, came to an agreement with them. You can have the snake park. Do with it as you wish. And I'll take the Croc Bank. And we parted, not amicably, but we parted, thank God. So I ended up at the Croc Bank. And we created a new trust, so uh, yet another NGO was created, and which is still going strong, as you know. And uh, this is the time around when the Wildlife Act was, uh, had been enacted. It was 76, 77, when it was enacted in every state, I believe, in, except Kashmir. And uh, that meant that the Croc Bank jurisdiction came under the Forest Department. They've always been a bit of a weird organization to work with. And uh, sure enough, we had our weird moments with them, survived them, of course, still surviving them. Um, the, f the funds for the Croc Bank uh, came from diverse sources like the West German Reptile Leather Association. And people were looking at us very quizzically. What do you plan to do with these crocodiles? Mm -hmm. <laughs> so, <laughs> And, uh, well, I mean, I was all for, and I'll get into that in a minute. But we, we didn't realize how well crocodiles breed. I mean, they really breed like rabbits, you know. They, they're amazing. You can't stop them, you know. You, well, you can. You can separate the males from the females. But, um, so, but we got... Um, we got funds also from various foreign embassies, from the Wildlife Preservation Trust International, and many other people. And they made it become one of the biggest and best crop farms in the world, I think. And the main idea then was to breed and rehabilitate crocs throughout the country, 
but this, what, this, ha this particular activity had been taken over by uh, the UN-supported crocodile, uh, government crocodile project. So we concentrate on making it a gene bank, an international gene bank for crocodiles. And now I'm quite happy to say, 37 years later, the croc bank, uh, as it is affectionately known, has, um, it, we have 18 of the world's 23 species of crocs. We get about half a million visitors a year. And we publish the only, um, the region's only peer-reviewed uh, herb journal, Hamadryad. We have an MOU with the NCBS, and uh, we, we have uh, uh, for collaborative research, and uh, the Croc Bank is the hub and a coordinator of all the activities of our uh, field stations, of our three field stations, but I'll get into a bit more of that. Meanwhile, uh, while all this was going on, the snakeskin trade was halted, the Wildlife Act uh, implemented, and the Irlas were out of work, and they were starving. So along with friends like Shekhar the Tatri and others, um, we uh, set up the uh, Irla Snake Catchers Cooperative Society so that they could continue to catch snakes, but, but now to produce venom for antivenom serum. And this actually took four years of bureaucratic wrangling uh, to achieve. And it, it was no joke because the Forest Department was not really ready to license people they called poachers to actually capture and keep wild animals, uh, no, even though it was for venom extraction. Um, and actually, this remains the only wildlife utilization program in India, although um, the edible nest swiftlets in the Andamans uh, just may be the second one coming up. So the Forest Department also levied 25% uh, royalty on all the venom that the Irla Co-op sold. So they filed a case uh, against the Forest Department, and it still persists to this day 30 years later. <laughs> isn't that a, that's kind of typical, isn't it? But perhaps the, uh, the biggest early problem was convincing the Irlas that this was their show. This was theirs. And it wasn't uh, Ram Whitaker's. Or, you know, it, it wasn't anything to do with us except that we helped them start it. They had to run it. They had to operate it. It, it took a couple of years for it to sink in, but it did. Um, the cooperative got big press coverage in something called the New China Daily. And I, I felt really proud about that. I mean, it's just something, you know, it was international recognition on that level. It was good. Um, the problem was that the only problem was and still is that the cooperative was under the Commerce and Industries Department of the Tamil Nadu government and because it was dealing with a chemical, venom. And, but the problems of dealing with this are uh, too much to go into here. It's just... <laughs> That's something else. That's a whole other line of story. But the Irla are still, uh, to this day, a, a wonderful group of people. They're much fewer now engaged in the snake business, so to speak, than they were then. But um, we had to teach them how to catch snakes gently. We had to teach them how to look after them, how to extract the venom, how to process the venom. We had to get the equipment. Various grants came from the... the uh, I believe it was the British Council gave us money to buy a, a, a scale, and some uh, another donor uh, gave us uh, money to, to buy a, a lyophilizing machine for freeze drying the venom. It was really good. It was a lot of very very good public support. And um, today um, they are producing uh, the the the, Irla, the Irlas were very quick to learn, and um, the cooperative today produces. Uh, almost all the venom used to produce antivenom serum in the country. And don't forget, we have a, a, still a very serious problem of snake bite in India. As many as 50,000 people may be dying every year from snake bite. So it, it is something extremely, uh, it, it's an extremely vital function that they're performing. Um, okay, now hopping over to the Madras Crocodile Bank. In 1976, we opened the Croc Bank. The, the Croc Bank really did become what I like to call a center of learning and a base for research in herbs, basically all over India. And it was because of people like Satish Bhaskar, Mr. Sea Turtle. Um, he, was, he was the guy who walked almost the entire coastline of India looking for, to find where turtles were still nesting, and much of the coastlines of the islands, both 
the Lakshadweep group as well as the Andaman and Nicobars. Quite a character, more than quite a character. And um, he was based at the Kroc Bank, as was uh, Vijaya Jagannathan, who rediscovered the forest cane turtle, and which subsequently uh, the generic name of the turtle was changed to honor her. She's, she died uh, very young. Um, and I, I, I don't want to uh, forget the late Dhruva Basu, whom we very affectionately christened Mr. Garyal for his tireless work to conserve that crocodilian. Uh, we got into serious croc breeding there, and uh, we added monitor lizards, turtles, tortoises, and snakes. And the croc bank was making enough money to support the salaries, to feed the animals, and to uh, carry on and start out and carry on some field research projects. Mostly status surveys to start with, but later with grants from the Fauna and Flora International and other agencies, we actually started doing some pretty serious stuff like the Darwin Initiative work that we did in the Andamans, which takes us to the islands. Now, in 1976, I wanted to make a visit to the islands. However, I was stuck because my American passport meant that I couldn't travel in the islands. So um, I had always professed not to have any time for or interest in organized religion, organized nationality, organized violence. Uh, I mean, I was still a hippie deep inside. And so I won bright sunny morning in 1975. I walked down to the American consulate in Madras and said, uh, I want out. <laughs> I gave up my American citizenship, took Indian citizenship, and I was off to the Andamans. That was quite a jump, but it seemed very natural at the time. Sounds a bit weird now, maybe. <laughs> so, uh, the first trip to the Andamans was, was really just a, 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 a recce trip. But uh, it, I just wanted to look around and, and experience it, this, these magical islands. But the, the total sort of lack of environmental consciousness, uh, the conservation problems there made my blood boil. And, uh, and, for, and another obsession took over. <laughs> and eventually our, our work there involved everything from coral reef studies to, to fisheries, to crocs, to sea turtles, and herps in general. Um, we created uh, something called ANET because uh, the trustees at the Croc Bank at that time were thinking, hey man, the Andamans is way far away, we can't be involved in that. So uh, Zai and Zafar Fatiali and myself started something called the Andaman and Nicobar Islands Environmental Trust. And that persisted for several years, and, and uh, we did a little bit of work, not very much, but we involved uh, Satish Basak came over and did sea turtle work. That was probably the most important thing we were doing. We did some coral reef surveys with the uh, Central Agricultural Research Institute. We got grants from various places to do work like that. But um, we eventually, uh, it turned out to be a little bit bigger than we thought, and I, I thought it'd be better we turn it over to the Croc Bank, a larger organization. Uh, and so we changed the name to the Andaman and Nicobar Environmental Team. So that's what you see today, ANAT. Uh, I bought back then a, a half an acre of land, but it certainly wasn't enough for all the grandiose ideas we had. So again, we uh, searched for and got grants from um, the Dutch, the Norwegians, the Swedish. Interesting, mostly Scandahooligan grants at that time. Pardon me, Scandinavian grants. I'm a Scandahooligan myself, so I can say that. Um, uh, and we bought uh, a guy called Ashok, uh, Alok Malik was uh, helping us out do stuff there, and he actually located five acres of land in Wandur, which is now the uh, center of island ecology, Anna. So. At that time, I had this obsession with something called the Barrow, Colorado Island Forest Research Station in Panama. I'm sure a lot of you have heard about it. It's, it's a fantastic place, and, and the longest 
a bit of rainforest research going on there anywhere in the world. I mean, for, for 75, 80 years, they've been working there. And I thought we should have something like that, at least starting small. So uh, we started, uh, we, we reforested this piece of land that we got, and built places for people to stay. And the original vision was that this would be the premier environmental NGO for the islands, a watchdog organization, a research base. And that's what it became. We started with the Darwin uh, initiative work, uh, doing rapid faunal assessments of all the protected areas there. And then much, much later, when the uh, tsunami hit, and it was on the forefront of, of relief activities with people like Harry Andrews and Manish Chandy leading the uh, the charge, so to speak, to remote places in, in uh, the badly hit Nicobars. And in a tragic setback there, we lost uh, eight of our team members at the Leatherback nesting site. They were camped on uh, at Great Nicobar on that fateful day. But, you know, uh, there was work going on, yes, but uh, there was um, there were great periods of time when nothing was happening there and there, and there was no research going on. And, I was sort of getting a little worried until fairly recently, around 2008, when a lady called Tasneem Khan took over the reins and helped us turn Anit into a thriving research, education, and conservation action base. And now Anit has a formal tie-up with NCBS, the Duction Foundation, the Nature Conda uh, Conservation Foundation, and other organizations and individuals I mean, I can't even keep track of the stuff that's going on now. It's, it's fantastic. It's great. Um, uh, this is uh, the, the main office uh, at, at Annette. Those of you who have been there know it very well. And those of you who haven't, well, I urge you to come over and check it out. And uh, the, the work that's going on there is vast and great. Okay, now, another meanwhile. Meanwhile... The Irla women, while they were fine with the idea that their husbands were back to catching snakes, legally, said that a lot of the money that they make never reaches home. Uh, guess why? Booze. I mean, I like a drink now and then myself, but no money was getting home. So the, we had to do something about that. Okay. So they wondered if, we could, if something could be started for them to earn with. And um, sure enough, uh, uh, Zai Whitaker, Revati Mukherjee, and other friends and I set up the Irla Tribal Women's Welfare Society, which, concentrated, which concentrates on income generation and tribal women's empowerment. The challenges were not so much uh, external in this case. And it was very different from the other stuff that I had been setting up and working with. But it included the fact that helping to empower people sometimes brings out the worst. And there were severe altercations among some of the women which we had to work through. I mean, yeah. Uh, it was a good learning curve, though. The tribal women were vociferous and tough. Uh, I remember the old days, trying to raise money to support reptile work. And it was a tough grind compared to getting funding for tribal women who were uh, g going to plant lacs of trees on village wasteland. And that's what they did at the, right from the start with a fat grant from something called the National Wasteland Development Board. Now, I remember going to Delhi on one of my begging pilgrimages and meeting Bunker Roy and how pleasing it was to be told, yeah, sure, we can fund the Women's Society for tree planting. And that's what we did. Um, there's a couple of side, sideways pictures here. I'm not very good at all this. Uh, <laughs> Photoshop stuff, but anyway, you get a nice just turn sideways and see. Those are all the seeds that they plant, and these are some of the village lands that we did. We did plant lacs of trees. We still are <laughs> quite amazing. I'm glad you're laughing. Uh, um, well, actually, the ITWWS, the Irla Tribal Women's Society, is located very close to where we live right now, and we watch it going from strength to strength. And it was very different. The, the women are more interested in achieving uh, a, a distinct uh, and, and decent social standing, getting their ration cards and other benefits owed to them, and keeping their husbands in line. 
scary, huh? Anyway, this is what you do when you empower them. Uh, okay, in, 19, in 2005, uh, the Garial Conservation Alliance was born. And we started off as calling it the Garial Multitask Force, trying to be gender correct, if you get my drift. And uh, GCA did come off with a, a real bang, and, and we raised quite a bit of serious money from international funds, from the San Diego Zoo, the uh, Mohammed Bin Zahir Foundation, WCS, Prague Zoo, and, and plenty of others. And we were there when the Garial die-off happened in the, uh, in the, on the Chumbul in 2007. Uh, this Garial die-off was a very strange event, a very singular event. And um, along with WWF, we got a, a team of international vets over uh, to try to figure out what had happened. And in general, we collaborated with the uh, MOEF and helped to highlight the plight of the Garial and, of course, the beautiful river, which is their last stronghold, the Chumbul. And um, for the past few years, we've been collaborating with Jeffrey Lang on a, a radio telemetry uh, study of the Garial. Um, this was reported in the WIS Envis last year. And uh, we're also now working with various state forest departments and NGOs towards securing the f uh, future for, for, the, for the Garial. And it's a fantastic creature. It's, it's unlike any other crocodilian. Um, Raising funds for the Garial uh, was not uh, so much of a challenge simply because of its incredible charisma and the fact that its survival is really so tightly linked to the survival of all these major rivers. These are the real lifelines of the people of North India and, and a whole range of wildlife from river dolphins to, to Indian skimmers. I mean, you, it, it's quite incredible. Okay, in 2005, I was wandering around Agumbe uh, in Karnataka along in the Western Ghats while we were in the midst of making yet another film about King Cobras. But, uh, and I found this piece of land in the, in the forest with, with a beautiful stream flowing through it. And it, it was surrounded by forest, but it was farmland and it was for sale. The, the elderly couple, their kids had moved off to the city. They, they said, you will buy it? And uh, I said, <laughs> yes. And uh, my mother uh, had left me um, just almost exactly that amount of money required uh, in her will to me. It was just so fortuitous because I had talked to her before her death about, yeah, we should set up something in the rainforest. It just all worked out, you know, one of those magical things that happens sometimes. Uh, so I bought the land and we went around, we have been uh, about setting up ARRS. Well, ARRS, people tried to dissuade me from that acronym, uh, but it has a certain magic. <laughs> and, I, I mean, like, like it or not, the Whitley Foundation, for example, in the UK, gave us a, a really generous grant, and, and we were able to set up the first real uh, rainforest field station in the Western Ghats. And, um, wow, yeah, that's what we did. Well, setting up a field base now was kind of old hat. You know, we were professionals by this time. And, but finding a way to keep that field station self-sufficient was not so easy. Uh, trying to keep <laughs> equipment intact when you are experiencing up to 10 meters of rain every year, that's no joke either. And, you know, never mind the occasional leech bite. But um, I'll leave that on for a while for you to absorb. Uh, <laughs> uh, Okay, my lifelong obsession was king cobras. Okay, I mean, come on, I'm a herpetologist. I like snakes. King cobras, wow. Okay, I mean, really, they blow me away still to this day. I see one, and my heart goes pitter patter. Um, but it was an easy choice for our first big research project, and we did a, a, a pretty unique and really good project on uh, following snakes uh, using radio telemetry. And uh, this was also reported in the w, uh, WII Envis last year, a, a full report about it. We followed five snakes uh, throughout their fascinating daily life cycle. We monitored more than a dozen uh, king cobra nests. It's the only snake in the world which makes a nest. 
Um, it, it's, its genus name is Ophiophagus because it's a snake eater. It only eats snakes. It doesn't eat rats and it doesn't eat other stuff. Although they occasionally take a monitor lizard thinking it's a snake. Maybe that's a clue to how closely linked monitor lizards are with snakes, I thought. Anyway, some of you people might figure that out someday. How closely are they related? Anyway, does anyone know? Anyway, we also... Um, uh, um, okay, this is a beautiful female king cobra looking straight at us. And uh, we also rescued um, over a hundred king cobras from people's houses which had entered into their houses and gardens. And the only problem was uh, everyone started thinking that ARS was just a king cobra research station and that's all. Uh, but the whole king cobra thing ha happened thanks to uh, funding from various zoos in the states, Gladys Porter, River Banks, the National Geographic Society, uh, Disney, and a, a lot of other very generous supporters. Um, this particular picture was taken after we had watched the female actually put together this nest over a period of eight days. She gathers all the leaves together, makes this massive nest, and makes a perfectly waterproof tight place for her to lay her eggs inside. All extremely fascinating stuff. Um, but as everywhere we work, uh, we, we're making good friends with the local people, neighbors in particular, uh, and helping them whenever possible, keeping on the good side of the local panchayat and the local police and the local forest department. All this brings very good karma and helps, to, and helps very often to get difficult things done. In this case, the STF anti-natural force of Agumbe. I mean, where are the Naxals? Come on. I mean, we won't go into that. But they're all there in force, these guys. And they're all rather frightened of snakes, but they all have big weapons. And rather than use the weapons on King Corvus, we decided a little education might help. And it did. So, um, uh, again, the ARS MOU with NCBS has been a fantastic step forward for our fledgling research station. And we're looking forward to some really dynamic areas of research being conducted, being started right now, as it's happening right now. And it was uh, very gratifying to note that um, as much as 50% of the master's degree candidates over the last few years have sort of graduated, so to speak, from Agumbe, have done some work there or passed through there. It's quite an exciting uh, thing that, that we've interested that many uh, people in, in this area. Because we had concentrated initially entirely on herpetology, but now we're sort of getting into uh, just about everything. Uh, everything from lichen to leopards and lion-tailed macaques up in the canopy, and of course, flying lizards. I'm going back to herpetology. I can't get away from it, can I? So uh, during that, uh, uh, while things this is all happening. I was kind of a peripatetic human being. Maybe I still am to some degree, but I was doing other stuff too. Between uh, 79 and 89, I had all these wildlife consultancies going on. And I, I, during this decade, I was very happily globetrotting around. I, I, went, I went to places like New Guinea and, and uh, met uh, and worked with croc hunters there and, uh, and, and Mozambique and Bangladesh. And, and they were mostly pro uh, projects which were related to sustainable use of crocodile resources, Hap uh, you know, helping uh, to set up buying schemes for uh, croc eggs and young crocodiles for the farmers, and by using designated numbers of surplus crocs for the skin and meat trade, vast numbers of uh, vast areas of, of rivers and swamplands were actually spared from deforestation and conversion to rice fields. And, um, and this was uh, almost exactly what had been happening in Louisiana for decades in the United States, uh, utilizing uh, the, the uh, alligator population there commercially on a sustained basis and not letting McDonald's clear the swamps and grow grasslands to raise cows for hamburgers. So. It, it, it meant something. Now, India doesn't really subscribe to this. We're not very interested in doing this, going this route. 
Uh, the amazing comeback of crocodiles, however, in many parts of the country is leading to some very negative feelings about uh, these large, somewhat dangerous aquatic predators. So, uh, to the average person, crocs have no redeeming value, and perhaps we'll really have to someday look at other options to allow these animals space in what we call our human landscape. Um, Okay, uh, another thing I was doing uh, on the side, sidelet, we say in Tamil, uh, <laughs> was between 1985, from 1985 onwards to this year, I was involved in telling the stories of what I'm telling you tonight by making documentary films. In fact, at one stage, I was going to be a filmmaker. I subscribed to Screen Magazine and, you know, met all the directors and, and tried to you know, make links and, and learn stuff about filmmaking and got, bought me a Bolex camera, a wind-up camera. I was really, really into it. And I even made a feature film in Tamil for the Children's Film Society of India called, uh, what was it called? The Boy and the Crocodile, yes. And uh, it was very exciting. It was really exciting. I, I may sound as though I'm joking about it, but I, I was very deeply into this whole film idea and I felt we can me reach millions and millions of people uh, you know, much better than we could with the croc bank or the snake park. And I, I think we did. Um, some of the filming was a lot of fun, as you can imagine. Okay, and then starting with school friends, the Reber's and Shaker Datatri, we made some small documentaries, and then I had a real breakthrough. I worked with a, a, a couple called Carol and Richard Foster, and they, we made a film called Rat Wars for National Geographic. The big time National Geographic, man. They don't know anything about geographic, by the way. I'll tell you another story about that later. <laughs> <laughs> They're Americans, after all. They, they know geography. No, that's not one of their strong points. So, um, yeah, but then, quite by accident, I met this girl called Janaki Lennon, and um, she was a, a graduate of the film school in Madras, so she was a film editor. And we teamed up, and, and we ended up making this film about king cobras. They told us uh, uh, king cobras, I mean, snakes only have one expression. They don't smile, they, they don't look angry, they just look the same all the time. Whether, so how are you going to make a film? Anyway, it got an Emmy Award, an Emmy. <laughs> I didn't even know what an Emmy Award was, yeah. And they said, no, you have to come to New York to get the Emmy, you have to put a suit. And I said, well, I don't have a suit, so I, I can't come. So I didn't. But they sent the Emmy Award here, and they sent me a certificate. So anyway, I learned pretty fast that we had done something good. And, and, it, and sure enough, that w we went on to make quite a few more films. And um, they, some of them were really interesting. One about crocodiles all over the world. They took me to Australia and Ethiopia and all sorts of really cool places. And we watched crocodiles galloping. Can you imagine? This is the Australian freshwater ca crocodile who actually gallops when it gets away from, wants to get away from you. He wanted to get away from me, obviously, very much. And uh, we made uh, a film for BBC Natural World called Crocodile Blues a few years ago, and that was the time when the die-off was happening in the Chumbo. And um, most recently, we made a film um, uh, uh, called Leopards, 21st Century Cats. And uh, we were very honored to work on this film in Vidya study site in Akole in Maharashtra. And uh, I got this wonderful chance to play with a young leopard. And they never showed it in the film. They, they, I'm not sure. <laughs> I, I think I know why. I was probably looking very nervous. <laughs> but it was really quite an ex experience. Um, OK, to, to wind up, my latest sort of um, efforts or concentrated effort is, is something that I've been trying to get around to for a long time, and that is to work on snake bite mitigation, a, a project which involves collecting venom samples from around the country, uh, studying them, tying up with the Indian Institute of Science, the uh, 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 the toxinologists, uh, the Christian Medical College, the clinicians, and trying to, trying to uh, work on uh, the distribution of the uh, and to determine the 
distribution of the main species responsible for all the serious snake bites in the country, for public education to teach people how to avoid and how to protect themselves, how to treat snake bite, and, and to get adequate supplies of antivenom around the country. So it's something pretty big, and I, I feel very humbled in trying to be part of it because it's a very, very big thing, which I, I really believe the government of India should be doing much more for. The, the, the World Health Organization calls it a serious neg seriously neglected tropical disease, and it indeed is. So um, that's, the, that's my story. Um, it's just a quick summation of half a century of getting some solid work done. Yeah, but it, it, let me tell you that despite some hardships and strife on the way, um, it's thanks to many animal and human friends that it's been quite a roller coaster ride of a life, and it ain't over yet. Wanna come? <laughs>